Ask for those two cases, please. Shari, you cool. Thank you. So <coughs> the one at tab one, so that's the Walker Two yep. Corporation case. Fifty nine to seventy are the key paragraphs there. Thank you. Um, I think the other one was the Ormaka Valley Group one, mm -hmm. tab four. Um, the key passages from um, paragraph 95, 95 to 120. Thank you. And I think I gave you the condition references for the Poplar Lane consent tab yep. five. And yep. 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 Okay, thank you very thank much you. for that. Questions? Commissioner Coffin. Good morning. Um, I, I'm, I'm assuming you're the lead for the applicant. You're going to be the main person we're going to be talking to in terms of the applicant? In terms of the legal submissions, by all means, sir, yeah. Okay. Uh, look, I'm, uh, yeah. Sure. I've, I've got a, a number of questions and more clarifications, just as a heads up before we go th into the um, uh, each of the witnesses. Thank you. Um, so it'll just give you a favour for some of the questions I'm going to ask, so I don't catch them cold, so they're a little bit more prepared than we'd like. Thank you very much. It's very helpful. Um, I'm sure they'll be scribbling <coughs> furiously. <laughs> So they're, they're a little bit random at the, at the okay. present time. Um, one of them is, is, is going to be around the, the distance of the discharge field from, from a waterway or surface um, of a water body. That's the sanitary uh, And that's either discharge. 20 metre, 40 metre. Um, so just as more clarification about which one is it and then I'll be asking some questions perhaps of of the applicant and perhaps also the council officer around what's the determining factors for working out that distance. Thank you, yes. Um, obviously, um, I'm going to have some questions around the, the cultural impact assessment from Te Runga Ngatiao, which you, it sounds like you have received and yes. you've been able to perhaps glance at it and, and just wondering if the applicant's going to have a view in responding to some of those matters. And you've, in your legal submissions, you've sort of summarised what we see the gist of where the cultural assessment is coming from, but perhaps there might be one of your witnesses that will be able to answer questions in regards to a response to the applicants or some of yes. those specific matters. That's right, sir. Yeah. yeah, and as I mentioned when I went through my submissions, I, I read that uh, you know a lot of a lot of the points made by Natiawa to the extent they're not the constitutional regulatory matters, mm. which I think probably are most fairly directed at me or Ms. Osman, the planner. Okay. Um, otherwise, they go to effects on the aquifer, and and it's you know, and the sustainability of the take and preserving the characteristics of the aquifer. And so yeah. Mr. Well, Goff is the key witness. I think, um, questions about uh, okay. So in that regard, I, I have some questions around um, some of the, we'll call them constitutional matters, but also the part two matters that may relate to the this yes. application in regards yes, to enough. responding to the matters that Ngatiao have raised and then the second part of is specifically related to the aquifer um, so just in terms of some of those ones related to the um, constitutional well, I'm using your terms here <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm using someone else's terms as well but <clears throat> um, I have some questions around where does the declaration for fresh water sit mm. um, and whether and I've got some specific questions around whether it's actually been lodged with council, whether it was recognised by an iwi, plan, uh, iwi authority. You know, do, does it constitute an iwi planning document in terms of the RMA, or is it one of those other matters that we should consider? That's 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 a broad question. Yes. Um, and then in, for part two matters, particularly around the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi, um, uh, Article two has been mentioned in submissions, and also in, obviously in your submission as well. Yes. But also there's the specifically related to the Act, the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi, and I'm interested to know, both from the applicant and also from the council officers, what they, and, and Ngātio particularly, what they consider that the, are the most relevant principles of the Treaty of Waitangi that the, that the panel should take into account. Yes. Perhaps, I mean, if I could give an initial sure. A uh, comment or two on those matters, um, if that's okay. Um, yeah, the plan, uh, w whether the um, Matatua Declaration on Water is a iwi management plan proper, you know, re required to be mm. um, factored into the planning process and so on. And, and recognised by an iwi authority, lodged with the council, yes. relevant for those matters, you know, region, the district. 
yes. uh, and, and has been recorded by the council. I'm not sure. So, yes, here's yes. the question. Uh, I'm not 100% sure either. Um, I mean, the, 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 the overall point is that um, whether it's one or the other, whether it's a... Well, I think it's always... Either way, it's going to come within that other matter thing, right? Mm. It's not a planning instrument proper for the purposes of Section 104 1B or whatever. So it's always going to be another matter. Yep. And that's that's kind of where it comes to from my perspective. Okay. You know, it's a, it's a matter to which the panel can have regard in the usual way. And, and place such weight on it as it sees fit. Um, but I would I would temper that with the submission I think I made, and that's that, well, I didn't make it specifically to the Matatu Declaration. And that is, the, po the point I think that submitters seek to rely on it for um, comes back to this assertion of mana over the resource. Mm. And, you know, and, um, you know, kawanatang almost, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a sovereignty matter. Um, and while, of course, uh, as I said, that's um, an issue to be worked through at a national level and an important thing and um, certainly a, a statement of mana um, and a statement of, oh, I don't want to call it an aspirational statement of ownership of resources, you know, because it's, it's much, much, more, much, more, much more than that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the circumstances in which it's relevant to this decision are really very constrained. Um, you, can, uh, you can understand that there has been this declaration and you can understand that Ngāti Awa are showing and others are showing leadership in this area and in, in this national conversation. Um, and that gives context to these applications and to where we, where we are and what, what you're going to hear about in this week. Um, but beyond that, we have to play the field as we see it in terms of the law. And that's the law about the ownership of water and it's the law in the RMA as it relates to allocating that resource to yeah. users. I think I'm certainly clear in my mind about what's the panel's um, jurisdiction in regards to ownership, and yes. but putting the ownership to one side, what yes. it seems those other matters, I'm, I'm quite keen to hear from the different parties what they think those other matters that we may be able to consider should be. Yes, thank you. Okay, that's okay. where I kick it to the planners then. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Um, uh, uh, this is that, again, this is random. There's There's been some submissions around potential effects on Te Kohi Kapa, which is yes. quite some distance yes, away. Yes, so comment on that. Um, <laughs> yes, so I'm just interested in, um, particularly around the relationship between the aquifer and the water table of that area. Yes. I have in my, my mind where I, where, I, where I think that is, but I'd rather know. Yes. Um, and certainly um, what might be the... Um, there was a, an exhaustive condition report, I think, done by Heritage New Zealand some time ago around the condition of Te Kohika Pa. What, were the, what was the indicator of moisture in, that, in the soils there? I think there's a drain there. So uh, I was interested to know if, if, if the applicant knew of what, what, what the main influences were of moisture water table at Te Kohika Pa. Yes. And whether that had any relationship at all, direct or indirect, with the aquifer. Okay, so thank you. Yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll hear from, uh, I, I suspect that there are some answers we can give you today on that. Mr. Yeah. Goff, will, he's got some supplementary evidence. Yes, yeah, and I saw that. Um, address to yeah. Kukipa in it. Um, there was some information we received about salt and intrusion and also the relationship with the pressure of the, in, the, in the groundwater as well, yes. which was quite useful. Right, right. Um, Beyond that, so speaking to the Heritage New Zealand document, for example, I haven't seen that, and I haven't, I've, I'm not aware that. Um, it was one of those. It was a, oh. one of the reports in the thousand plus pages that we've we've read. In that case, I definitely. Read I can't it. remember the exact <laughs> of it. Um, the point I was, well, I think, yeah, uh, you know, Ngati Awa's evidence came in late, of course, and, yes. and I don't, I don't see a procedural matter to deal with in that respect. You know, there's no. You know, we, we, we've been scrambling a little bit to consider it, of course, but I don't want to take an issue with that or okay. require them to seek a waiver of timeframes or anything like that. Um, but yeah, Mr Goff has looked into that <coughs> Te Kohika Pa issue and we'll be able to give you whatever guidance. Okay. And <coughs> any questions remaining um, unanswered from those exchanges, um, perhaps we can address in reply or get, get further guidance to you through the hearing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Obviously, there's this question of the term of consent for the different consents and, yes. and the different views of the applicant, <coughs> uh, the consent officers uh, and technical experts. And so I, I know us as a panel, we're quite keen to narrow that down into the quite specific 
reasons for the for the um, differences of opinion. Yes. Um, and I think some work has already been done in that regard. Um, certainly I'm a little bit confused which is the most recent reflection of the disagreement between the parties in regards to the terms of consent. Yeah, and, and look, I, yeah. there's been a, 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 there's been a process that I think overall has been very, very helpful. Mm. Uh, obviously, if questions come in which, are, mm. you know, um, which have been able to be considered by the, the, the witnesses in advance of today, um, and Ms Cranswick has you know, her own process of uh, lodging proposed conditions you know, a, bit, a bit after her 42A report, which is just, it's just the way of the world. Sometimes, and so we've, I think we've, we've got a situation on conditions where there have been work streams operating in parallel, and that crossover hasn't really yeah. hasn't really properly happened. And to be fair to the panel, that needs to happen. Um, Ms. Osman, I know, will, and Mr. French, I'm sure, will be able to talk today about um, the 42A report author's responses to the questions yep. put by the chair, and so that will give us a bit more of a steer. But I, I really think there'll be value in people putting their heads together um, to the extent the timetable allows that. Um, between the now and the end of, end of the hearing, or, 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 had, or, yeah. or at least explaining what the panel's after in terms of... Yeah. We've had a, a, short, a very short chat about how we would like to receive that, but we'd certainly be guided by you in the first instance sure. to make that as easy for us as possible. I think to avoid having many versions of, yes. of the consents and trying to correlate who said what at what My particular plan, time, yeah. we'd like to know by the end of this hearing, this is the view of the different parties at the particular time. Yeah, yeah so just to clarify on that point, as part of your written reply, we would mm. require a one suite of recommended conditions mm. that outlines differences between the applicant and the reporting officers. Where there is a difference, we'd like to see the applicant's preferred wording in one font and the reporting officer's wording in a different font, and we yes. will then decide accordingly. Yeah. Thank you, and sir. understand that may not be achievable by the end of Wednesday, but. Um, you take as long as you need as part of your reply preparation to get that work done. Thank you, sir. Yep. Yes, and yep. we will. Okay. Um, again, back to the theme sure. of um, um, archaeology. Oh, yes. Um, this is just re related directly to the application site. I'm interested in knowing what, um, if you have any experts or are able to get um, a view about the likelihood of finding archaeology at the application site. This is specifically regarding um, earthworks. Yes. Um, so in the documentation we have to date, there is talk of potentially having monitoring of the site, there's the potential for a mana whenua liaison group and those types of things, but I'd, I'd prefer to go back to the to understand what is the likelihood of something being found on the site. Understand um, the point. And then f in terms of effects, and then from there work yes. out what might be an appropriate approach if, if we were in mind to consent. Thank you. Yes, uh, from memory there might be something in the application along the um, I'm street. There's a few things. There there's was certainly the been discussions reference to the, I think, the Ngātiawa sites of Awahitapu sites. Yes. Um, but, I'm, but I'm specifically talking about recorded archaeological sites in the New Zealand Archaeological Site Record Scheme. understand. Thank you. And, um, and Ngāti, Ngāti Rangiti here, of course, have, uh, yeah. had a view on that and suggested the protocol on things. Okay. Thank you. So that might be a matter for one of us to... We, we will certainly come back yeah, to the one... It sounds like you might have to do a little bit of work just before that happens, so that's, that's fine. Um, I have, I'm going to have, be asking um, Ngāti Awa, but I'll just let you know what the question is right now, and that's just around... I want to understand what is the boundary of the Tarawera River. Um, and there, there might be different ones. There might be a legal boundary, there might be a statutory boundary... Uh, and there might be others as well that I'm not aware of. So I just want to be really clear about that. Um, and the reason why is, is it just relates to my earlier question around the distance of the um, wastewater discharge field from the surface of water body. So I'm just wanting to understand what is the, where is the boundary of that water body. Thank you. This is a, a minor matter, perhaps, but there's, there is reference in the application to the... This is, again, related to the term of consent around crediting nine years. I, I was confused by the term crediting nine years. I hadn't come across that before, so it was just a... It was more for just for me to understand where that came from. Yes. Yep. Um, perhaps, a, perhaps a loose uh, suggestion 
you know, rather than a legal requirement or anything like that. Does it reflect the remaining term on the existing bottling tap? Oh, I can then sit like it. Um, I mentioned the Manafenua liaison group, so I've got a question around, this is, the first one's a dumb question, uh, who's proposed it? Um, and then two, what was seen as the purpose of the Manafenua liaison group, and particularly for the panel related to effects. So what was going to be the role of, the, of, of that proposed group uh, in regards to effects of the proposal? Thank you. I think, I think the second answer, sir, the mm. uh, second question, is partly answered by the by Mr. Glyson's answer to the question from the chair about mm. tangible outcomes to come through that yeah. process, um, and I can certainly say uh, I, I wasn't privy to the discussions where it was <coughs> first mooted and where where it came from, mm. but certainly there is there have been um, and I shouldn't give evidence from the bar, but Mr. Glyson has has explained, has he? There, there's evidence from him about the 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 idea behind the process, <coughs> and. His answer to the question last week talked about, uh, again, I think ref referred to some discussions that have been had. So there's, there's, there, there are ongoing discussions and whether, uh, you know, and, and buy into a process. Perhaps just a little more detail about some of those discussions yes. and what, uh, any commitments um, yes. that have been made that might be within the purview of what we're looking at or, or outside. That would be just good to know the context of that. Yes, yes. Yeah. I just, just, just leave you with one point before you turn yeah. to the next subject, and that's just that. In Mr. Glass's response to that question last week, he made it pretty clear that the company is going to be led by those with Manapena are about. Yes. The purview, the parameters of the discussions, um, the outcomes sought, and, and, and the nuts and bolts. But there are some ideas that he gave in that. Yeah, in that, well, I suppose for us as a panel, we'll be looking at what's the appropriateness if, if we were of a mind to include conditions around something like that, whether it was appropriate to have in a condition or yes. as part of a site agreement. Yes, fine. Yeah. Thank you. I was talking to our chair because he's a more of an expert in this area, but I was I was interested in the word carbonaceous biochemical oxygen demand. I, BOD I'm familiar with, but carbonaceous I wasn't. But he, he informed me that perhaps it was something to do with the laboratory and the testing. So I was just it was just a question from my own mind. Yes. What did that actually mean? Uh, but there's, we'll leave that for an expert to explain I think that that's to me. very sensible. Yeah. Just tended to get Alan to answer that, but no, I think Rob Fulton sure. or Kieran Miller will be able to help us with those things. Um, and uh, there was a question around um, um, condition 5.2 and 5.3, I think it was of the take consent proposed conditions around who's profit by the applicant in regards to addressing the concern of Whakatane District Council in regards to any effects on the municipal supply during cleaning, I think it yes. was. Um, and the Regional Council Council Officer has said that they may not be enforceable if it's my memory serves me correctly. Um, so I was just interested in, in the applicant's view in regards to whether it was appropriate to have that condition in the consent or whether it would, would be appropriate as suggested perhaps by the council officer that it should be part of a site agreement. So just interested in a response to that. Yes, and the, uh, so the, the witnesses for Creswell have seen those exchanges and I think Mr Goff and maybe Mr French will mm. address you on those things. I suppose from my, my legal perspective is I've seen similar conditions before, of course, and some of those NZ, large NZ, NZTA projects where there are effects on groundwater tables and, and bore users who might be... Yeah, I think the concern was mainly around if there's an alternative water source, what actually is it? Yes. Yeah, and the detail of that, and whether that could be enforced or not through the consent. Yes, and maybe I'm missing something, but... Um, yeah. It was just a question. Yeah. Oh, I understand, yeah. 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 There's, there's a simple <coughs> point, which is that if... Um, in a, in a highly unlikely event, by the way, on the evidence, mm. that um, there is any effect on people's drinking water. Creswell's got a whole lot of water bottled at that site. You know, it's, it may, and perhaps it's as, as simplistic as that, but perhaps the, the experts will, um, will tell us more than that. Uh, otherwise, of course... I hope you weren't suggesting that everyone gets a, a bottle of water. Is that what you're suggesting? Um, yeah, that's what I'm suggesting. OK. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe <laughs> maybe two if you need. The, the, the point is okay. that um, uh, you know, Ms. Cranswick said that, that Creswell hasn't sought water for that purpose, okay. i.e., the purpose of replacing the supply of the people of the of the district if the Fakatane district's bore was affected. <coughs> but it, you know, it's, that's the business it's in. 
mm. providing water and right. bottles. Um, yeah, and in, in other parts of the country where I've seen those conditions in action, it's more about you know water carts and bringing them in. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's know, what, it's not, that's not, not a matter of the person running off and getting a, a consent, an emergency consent to take more water for that purpose. It's tapping into other people's allocations for mm. that purpose. But of course, the scale here, I suppose that's the point with this bore and the take from by, by the district is, a, is of a different order, I think. But yeah, from a legal perspective, it's certainly, um, you know, it's a, there's an obligation there, and I would have thought it's enforceable. Uh, and the last one, this is again, this is part of my random list, is the, is the truck movements, and you've already raised this around the 184, and it, it seemed difficult in my mind to, to believe that it would be 184 truck movements every day, 365 days yes. a year. That's improbable, but it would be good to understand what's the range of those, the peaks, the troughs. Um, related to some of your other comments around the season and the busy time of the bottling plant, does a busy time of a bottling plant correlate with a busier truck movements? In my mind it does, but it, it, it might not be. There might be lags related to when supplies arrive and when the bottles actually leave the plant related yes. to when the bottling actually occurs. So just okay. to understand that a little bit better would be good. Thank you. That might be one which we need to take away rather than yeah. try and do some back of the napkin. I did have a, uh, my last question was just, I did have a question about some of the other bottling plants and understanding the size and scale. So you've um, helpfully included the consents for those. I suppose it would be just a clarification. Um, are those bottling plants still the same sizes from which they were consented for? Because you've given us copies of the consents. It'd be just interesting to know if they're still the same, the same operations. It's a good question. Yeah. And I will, yeah, I will, I will, we will get yeah. an answer on that. Um, I've been to the Antipodes plant and it sort of seemed of a similar order of yeah. scale than the, than the one that okay. the one originally consented. Okay. Um, they're, they're, they're very near to the site actually and it, it may well be that the panel um, would find some merit in swinging by them you know, from the from the public areas or whatever. But um, we can certainly get a technical answer to that question. Well, thank thank you. you. That was it. I've just got two matters I'd like to raise with you. The first one's at power 116. Yes, thank you. Uh, this relates to the issue, um, the applicants asserting that this is a primary production activity and as you've pointed out, the yeah. District Council reporting officer doesn't necessarily agree with that. In terms of Power 116, I understand why there's a functional need should the consent be granted to locate the site there because that's where the two wells are located. So that's clear in my mind, but the primary production activity is less clear in my mind if, this, if the existing wells were located in an industrial or a commercial zone, as for example, water bottling plants are in Napier, they are located in a heavy industrial zone in Awatauto. If in this case the existing wells just happen to be located in an industrial or commercial zone, would they be industrial and commercial activities? It's <laughs> an interesting question. It's almost like the, the gold mines under Waihi as well. You know, uh, it's, a, it's, it's clearly an uh, activity mining that's a rural productive activity as defined in the Pakatani district plan but if they happen, if we happen to be sitting on a gold mine you know in town um, does that affect the character of the activity I think that the, the point is that uh, and perhaps it's a, a bit more simplistic as usual my submissions on these things you know that um, it's a rural productive activity because it's uh, it's taking a raw material out of the ground in its primary state and working that to make a product and, and off it goes to, to market. Um, so it's, it's very much akin on my reading to, to mining, um, quarrying, forestry. And yeah, of course, our cities have tended to grow up away from the areas where there are those rich mineral resources. So, you know, um, so there's, uh, as a matter of fact, um, they tend to locate in the rural area. But I think, yeah, I, th I think Water bottling is essentially indistinguishable from those activities that <coughs> the definition in the plan does expressly contemplate. And um, there's the obvious point um, that that it's an includes definition as well. You know, it's not a, it's not an exhaustive list of the things that are considered rural productive activities. I, I think in the, the plan it has the terms uh, terms such as yes, um, but there's also the convention. If it's in the plan, it's in the plan. If it's not, it's not. So. Yep. No, no, that didn't actually answer my question. Mm. I'll just repeat my question to you. 
if the existing wells were located in an industrial or commercial zone, would the activities be industrial and commercial activities, the water bottling activities? I haven't looked at the, de the definition of industrial activities in the plan, which would probably be a good place to start for, to give you a, a proper answer to that question. So you come back to us on that? I can do, yes. I mean, it's a, uh, yeah, it, it, it's a, it's a, it's a good question, of course, but it comes back to reasonably esoteric things in my mind. You know, if you have a, if you have a commercial zone where retail activities take place, and then you have a farm, uh, farming a rural productive activity with a shop front or a cellar door on a on a winery, does that make that activity not a commercial activity? Mm. Yeah, we get uh, to ask the questions, you get to answer them. <laughs> I, was I was posing myself another one to, that I'd avoid answering, sir, but yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it comes back to that sort of question, you know, if, you, if uh, uh, you've got a residential zone and um, you've got people living there, of course, in their residences, but of course people live also in, in the industrial zone and the commercial zone. Um, and of course, I, I, I'm not suggesting that those residential things so become commercial just because you're either you know, residing in a commercial zone or, or indeed a, that living in a house is a, a necessarily a rural activity because people do it in the rural zone. Um, yes, but I will, I will go and consider the definition of industrial activity, um, sir, and, and yeah. give you a view on whether water bottling undertaken there would be that yeah. thing. Okay. Now, you drew our attention to tab two of the bundle, mm. which is the existing consent for the Robertson Farms yes. activity, and you took us to um, para 5.2 of that existing consent. Yes, sir. Uh, apologies, that's the that's the planning assessment, isn't it? And yeah. the, then the reasons are at the end. Yeah, I know, but I want to ask you about this part of the document. Thank you. Do you see down at D where it says further industrial development? Yes. The applicant does not intend expanding into other industrial activities on the site, which would tend to suggest to me that the water bottling activity was considered to be an industrial activity in this case. Um. And if you look at paragraph A, Council should be satisfied that the activity is required to be located in a rural zone rather than an industrial zone. Yes. So my reading of this part of the document points towards it being an industrial activity rather than not. I see the I see the the interpretation. Yeah. yeah I'll reflect on that, Sarah, okay. and come back to you if that's okay. I suppose that yeah, uh, uh, the part of the answer will be that it may be moot if the panel accepts my other contention that this is an activity that, that's tied to its location because of the nature that's of the... That's right. I mean, the right. functional need's pretty clear. Um, yep. and, and I guess it's my third question, leading on from those two questions, does the applicant's case hinge on us finding in favour of this being a primary production activity? No, no, no. it doesn't. Okay. And just one other question, para 137. And the question is, and this relates to the um, maximum take versus the average take over a year for yes. support order extraction. Is it our role as a hearings panel to assess the worst case scenario envelope of effects? Uh, in part it is, but that's not, the, that's not the entirety of the exercise before you. Yeah, you have, you have to. It's, it's obviously relevant to consider how <coughs> how great effects might be on any one day, mm -hmm. um, but it's definitely relevant to consider that temporarily across a period. Yeah, um, yeah you often talk, so you hear people talking about envelopes of, of effects when um, when flexibility is sought to located, you know, yeah. located a development within within boundaries, you know, a road, for example, within a designation, and obviously you need to assess the worst case because you're not sure about where it's going to be located towards the left or the right end of that of that designation corridor. This isn't really that case. This is a case where there's a, um, where there are, are assessed peaks mm -hmm. and um, effects that flow from that and then um, you can have some confidence because of the nature of the take and that's the point I'm making there at 137A. Yeah. Um, that that things will fluctuate downwards from that, yeah. but but completely take the point from both panel members. I think that um, that some more information about that would be useful. Yeah. 
So I've written down as your answer, yes in part, but that's not the entirety of our consideration. Yes. Is that a fair summary of what you said? Uh, I'm sure there are some other very good words in there too. Uh, it's, definitely it's definitely necessary um, yep. to consider how great the effects might be at any one time, but it's, it's also necessary to consider um, the length of the time that they'll be at that level and the length yep. of time they'll be at other, other levels. Okay, no, thank you very much for that. No further questions from the legal submissions. Thank you, sir. Now, just before you introduce your witnesses to us, I'd just like to inform the witnesses, remind you all that we've read your evidence that's been pre-circulated. Uh, we see little merit in you taking us to that pre-circulated evidence and reading bits of it to us, because that would be a waste of our time and your time, because we've already read it. Um, if you are going to um, provide additional information it would be our preference that you can find that to matters arising since the primary evidence has been written. Um, I've pre-circulated my written questions and they've been answered. I don't need you to read those answers to me or to refer to them. They were very clear. Thank you very much for that. Um, Commissioner Coffin has outlined some areas he'd like various witnesses to address and no doubt he will have further verbal questions for the witnesses and I may have one or two follow-up questions. So please just bear that in mind and uh, use your time wisely. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So there are 14 witnesses. Um, yep. some, will, some will probably take more of our time than others for obvious reasons. Um, I'll start with, with Michael Gleisner, who's the director of the Applicant Creswell yep. New Zealand Limited. Thank you. Who's sitting on my left and looking forward to speaking with you. Um, <clears throat> Shari's kindly made the lectern available. What I'm going to suggest after Mr Gleisner's um, answered any questions that you may have that he move over and the rest of the witness team kind of circles through this chair um, that he's in so they're nice and close to the mic but if they've yep. got any preferences about that then they can let me know and, and do something yep. else but that's that's the, that's the suggestion no, that's so fine. thank you thank you again sir here's mr glass and thank you very much um commissioners for the opportunity today to supplement my evidence by addressing evidence filed by by submitters and for considering um, our resource application and I will not, my speak, I won't talk for very long, I just want to address a couple of points. Yep. Um, just by way of background, um, is like, I'm obviously Michael Gleisner, I'm a director of Creswell and um, the direct representative in New Zealand of uh, Nongfu Spring here, um, a Chinese owned, um, very reputable and successful water bottling um, business. Um, I have a legal and business background. Um, I joined Nong Fu Spring in 2016. Previously, I held um, senior financial investment roles at Sea Lord Fonterra and New Zealand Super Fund. Um, I've overseen the project um, we are seeking to progress today from its outset in 2016 and have been intimately involved in the extensive consultations that we've had um, that we continue to do. Um, the impact assessments commissioned um, resulting project improvements, engagement with mana whenua and right from the outset and the community and the commitments that we have made to these groups since that time. Before I speak, I just want to mention one thing that I think that's quite important and sums it up quite well for us, a whakatauki or proverb, which I think to Creswell and to Nongfu Spring sums up our approach to the application. Um, mō te tangata, mō te rohe, me te mana o te wai, for the people, for the region, and for the mana of the water. And I think um, David touched on that um, as well, and I hope you will see in all um, our witnesses um, that that comes through, that it's very important to us as a company. Just a bit of background on Nongfu. Nongfu Spring, we're expanding internationally and would like to apply its capital ex and extensive know-how and capability to grow the Otakiri Springs business into a significant and sustainable water bottling and distribution business. To enable this, we're aiming to purchase the Otakiri Springs commercial water bottling plant to supply New Zealand and overseas markets, including China, while retaining the Otakiri brand and the commitment to um, the local people. Firstly, I'm incredibly proud to be working with Nongfu Spring. The company's strong experience, track record, supply chain and distribution and its global reputation in high quality water and beverage production is unquestionable. Unlike other New Zealand projects that you may have read and heard about, Nongfu Spring is a water bottler. This is what we do. We are not a 
a speculative opportunistic investor in New Zealand or in water. Flowing into Creswell is our Nongfu Springs values of honesty, integrity, sincerity, and giving back are reflected in a long history of community support, both in China through examples, for example, of child support of children and disaster relief, which you will have seen in my evidence, and also here in New Zealand. We've had the opportunity to do that. More than this, critically, Nongfu Spring has embedded sustainability and social and environmentally responsibility in its culture right from its beginning as a family-owned, operated entity in Hangzhou in China since 1996. The same values and principle will apply to our New Zealand operation. On this matter, it was very disappointing to read in an article recently on the 20th of April in the Fakatani Beacon, inferring that Creswell had, quote, paid local hapu to secure the support for this proposal. I want to state categorically that we have not and will not pay project supporters. This is not only against our corporate policy and values, but it is something we would never consider. From the outset, Creswell has worked hard to build its relationship in the community and to listen to understand and understand community views, including mana whenua, hapu and iwi, our immediate neighbors and business and political leaders. I return to this point below in light of a question put to me by the chair, um, which I did also try to address. As Nongfu Spring has done in China, Creswell has taken the opportunity to demonstrate its goodwill in the community, providing water to those involved in rescue efforts um, during the Edgecombe flooding, and a ra range of community events, including the Matato Kapahaka Regional Festival in February, which I had the privilege of attending, which is a great event, and um, other sponsorships um, that we have done um, when asked. These contributions are a start of our responsibility. We have a broader responsibility to improve lives and opportunities of the communities of Otakiri, Te Tiko, Edgecombe, Kawarau and Fakatani for the better. So from the outset, we have, been given, we have given careful thought to who may be affected by the project and have focused on consulting extensively with those parties throughout the life cycle. Very careful thought has gone into the project's design and proposed conditions that we've tabled to ensure the potential effects of the project on local and wider communities are minimized as far as possible. Our approach, consultation and evolution shows that we have undertaken, under, we, that we understand giving generously is important, but respecting, listening, and being part of and striving to improve the community and the environment in which we work is paramount. This idea is at the core of, our, of four principles and commitments we're making to local and regional authorities and the community. These are based on our listening carefully to mana whenua and stakeholders over the last year and so, and making every improvement to the proposed project possible based on their views. Firstly, we're committed to the ethical and sustainable management of artesian, the artesian water resource. The groundwater take, production levels, and treatment process of discharged water categories in our project's design and conditions reflect our sustainable ethos and the expert advice we've taken. Quite simply, sustainable water management is in our lifeblood. It is a commercial imperative for us. It's the same in China, where Nongfu Spring operates 18 commercial water facilities from eight high-quality water sources. Creswell's application here is to take 4.6% of the annual recharge to the aquifer available for consented take. We unequivocally support the Regional Council proposed Plan 9 change, limiting total abstraction for all users in the area to 35% of that average annual aquifer recharge. Of that 35%, this application seeks to take 13% of the allocation under the Bay of Plenty Regional Council's proposed rules. I would like to therefore specifically address a point raised by Spence McClintock um, from Two Faritoa Group Holdings. In his submission, he refers to a thousand times increase in water tank. With all due respect, Mr. McClintock's statement is misleading. Whilst we understand that Robertson Farms is currently not abstracting water to the maximum consented amount, the figures to focus on are the consented volumes 
so as not to compare apples with oranges. The current consent, as David Randall pointed, stated, is for 1,200 cubic meters a day. Creswell is seeking consent for a maximum daily take of 5,000 cubic meters a day. This is a 4.2 times greater than the current consented daily take of 1,200. The proposed average daily take is 3,000, which is 2.5 times greater than the current consent. Secondly, we are committed to making a positive contribution to the economic growth, social advancement, and community well-being in the surrounding community and Eastern Bay of Plenty. The project offers significant employment opportunities and economic advantages to energize Te Tiko, Edgecombe, Kaurau, and Whakatani. And in a region where there are three existing water bottling bottlers, and water bottling has been regarded as an economic um, development priority. In particular, we offer real and tangible jobs and training opportunities to change lives and communities that desperately need this boost. We are looking at a 500% increase in staff once the plant is fully operational and commit to hiring local members of the community first. Bill economist Mark Cox, who will speak after me, will detail some of the wider flow on benefits, including local business patronage through road usage, road haulage, sorry, and other goods and services and exports to the Port of Tarana. I want to acknowledge, though, the public interest around water exports rights and interests. Whilst, we're, whilst as, as Mr. Randall pointed out, these are not a relevant matter under the RMA, I can reiterate that Creswell is prepared to pay a royalty on the commercial use of water as a cost should of business should the government decide to impose one, provided the levy is fair and reasonable and, in our view, that proceeds from any such royalty are returned to the Eastern Bay of Plenty community. But I think that's <laughs> yeah. Thirdly, and of utmost importance, is our acknowledgement of the kaitiaki role of mana whenua, and protecting and respecting the Māori of the water source and other cultural perspectives. Indeed, Nongfu Springs chairman visited and engaged with mana whenua Fana, Hapu and Iwi as early as 2016 to understand their tikanga and commit to supporting this important guardianship role. He also undertook, and I just want to, I want to repeat that here, to Ngāti Awa and to Whāritoa Hapu, that mana whenua will be offered jobs first. We have actively engaged and we are continuing to engage with mana whenua, Fana, Hapu and Iwi to develop a framework to care for these Taonga elements. We will be appointing a Manafeno liaison person responsible for ongoing face to face engagement with local hapu. And you've asked about pract possible practical and tangible outcomes that Creswell hopes to see from that process. Without wanting to repeat um, my written answer, um, underpinning those outcomes is a commitment to demonstrating Creswell's respect for Tangata Fenua and their role as Kaitiaki. But to further to your question, we would be guided by. Um, the wisdom of mana whenua and, and, and yourselves in how to best progress this. It's a, I think it's an evolving, ongoing um, discussion. Yeah. Equally, we are committed to being a respectful neighbour, going above and beyond mitigating the impacts of the project and to enhancing the safety, security and well-being of the neighbourhood. I acknowledge the concerns of the neighbours around an increase of scale of the proposed plant, and we've committed, we've committed extensive mitigation of the impacts of the proposal on amenity, rural, transport, rural character, transport, visual and noise effects, as well as to continue to work with neighbours to take on board their suggestion. I would emphasize that greater scale is a pre prerequisite to expanding any business anywhere, including water bottling and to bringing flow-on benefits such as economic advancement and boosting jobs. Overall, we do believe the project benefits, particularly job opportunities, and considerably outweigh the level of adverse effects in the immediate neighbourhood after the improvements we've made with the conditions proposed. So finally, in conclusion, I've been heartened by the level of support in the submissions for this project and appreciate, of course, that there's some level of opposition. The expert evidence you will be hearing on behalf of Creswell today 
will shed more light and detail on, my over, on our overall proposal. In conclusion, I can re reinforce that supporting people, communities, and the environment has always been at the heart of Nongkru Springs and Creswell's values and principles. Having listened carefully to all stakeholders and proved the project assiduously, I believe this proposal holds true to our values and commitments. Creswell and Nongkru Spring, we look forward to bringing this project and its benefit to life and to being a hardworking, committed member of this wider community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions? Yeah, I, was, I was just interested in um, the, your, your original evidence is, um, sets out what the, the likely investment would be mm. moving forward. I'm just interested in what's the current value of the investment in, in the current site of the bottling plant. I think that's... Yeah. Or to carry commercial incentive, sensitive matter that oh, okay. I couldn't comment on. That's, oh, okay. that's to the existing owners, or the existing shareholders of Otakiri Springs. Because one of the considerations the panel has is the level of investment that the applicant has already made in the site. Yeah. Um, but, but completely understand yeah. the commercial okay. sensitivity around that. So that, okay. that's why I'm asking the question. Sorry, there's probably a legal matter in there that, <coughs> that I might address quickly, and that's, um, this is not a renewal a, a renewal application, interestingly enough, and that's, that goes to that credit point, yeah. the nine-year credit. Mm, okay. So, <clears throat> so strictly speaking, what the Robertsons have put into that place, uh, uh, it's, it's not, you know, it's a, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's not strictly relevant. Mm. It's really, um, the, the only point of talking about that 50 million value is to, um, it goes to term. Really? <coughs> yes, and I think that's been really clear in the evidence you've provided so far. Yes, yeah, that's right. yes, thank you. I think, but, yeah. yeah. I would also say, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's great that you, you'll take up the opportunity to visit the site, and I think you will, this, you will see that um, some of the equipment is pretty yeah. so standard, um, so you will see that there's been... We've understood in the evidence that the nature of the plant that exists there yeah. and, and the FTEs and, and, the, and the infrastructure that's around it, and I was just interested mm -hmm. in the value of that investment mm -hmm. at that particular time. Now, and, and the evidence you provided in terms of moving forward, that's been really clear as well. Yeah, that was the reason for the question. Thank you. Uh, no further questions, thank you. Just to... Um people here in the audience, you'll see that I don't have very many questions of the witnesses. The reason for that is I read their evidence in advance, I wrote down my questions, and the applicants' witnesses have answered my questions in writing. If any of you are interested in seeing both my questions and the answers, then that document's available, and I'm sure the council officers will print off copies for you. So I just wanted to make sure you understand that it's not on I'm not just interested in the evidence. I've already had the majority of my questions answered already. So just so you're aware of that. Next witness, please. Thank you, sir. This is Mark. This is Mark Cox, an economist. Good morning, commissioners. Um, I'm Mark Cox, senior economist with uh, Business and Economic Research Limited, more commonly uh, known as, as Burl. Um, I'm here to present my uh, evidence. Uh, um, uh, which arises from a, uh, an economic impact assessment I undertook for Nongpru Spring uh, early last year. Um, previous to that, uh, I, for um, Fakatani District Council, I undertook uh, uh, an economic impact assessment of the three water bottling plants collectively in, in the district. Um, uh, I understand that uh, you've taken my statement as read. Uh, mm -hmm. I do have a, a, a brief presentation in PowerPoint if you need uh, refreshing on any of my points, but uh, uh, if, if you don't, I'm simply happy to take any questions and to clarify any points. Thank you, Mr Cox. I, I, I don't need refreshing. Do you need refreshing on this one? No, I'm okay. fine, thank you. We don't need refreshing on what's in your primary evidence, so if you're happy to proceed to questions, so are we. Questions? Antoine, any questions? I didn't get any questions. Actually. Yeah, no, Mr. Cox, I have no questions for you either. Thank you. Thank you. Keep it short, sweet. And, sir, I should say that uh, <coughs> I've a bit of a misstep there. I should have said with Mr. Gleisner as well. Um, to the extent there's supplementary evidence to be produced by the witnesses, they've got copies, they've got hard copies. And, yeah. and 
I don't know if that, if those if are it's new material that we haven't yes. that we haven't seen, the witnesses should table that and read it. Of course, it. yeah. yeah, sorry, yeah and read it sorry, out loud to us. And so I should do that um, in retrospect for Mr. Gleisner and, um, so he has and for Mr. Cox's presentation as well. We may as well have that be, be tabled. But Mr. Gleisner just read that supplementary statement. Yes. As well as his presentation. Right. Uh, other witnesses just have a piece of paper with a supplementary statement. We'll get that to you before they start reading it. Okay, thank Apol you. Apologies. Yeah, good. Okay. Um, I'd ask Hamish Joyce to address you next. Uh, good morning, uh, I'm Hamish Joyce, uh, a Principal Project Manager at Becker in Tauranga, um, and I've got a degree in Chemical and Process Engineering. Um, my evidence related to uh, providing a general overview of the proposed plant operation uh, based on the concept, develop, concept design developed by my team. Um, this work described the key construction and operational parameters on which some of the effects assessments of others are based. Um, there has been no material change uh, in my evidence from that submitted. Uh, I could provide a bit more overview in terms of the operation from using the site layout, but um, it, it is all covered in my evidence. Yeah, your evidence was very fulsome and mm. so were the application documents, <laughs> which were lengthy and detailed yep. and we've read them, so um, if you don't have any supplementary evidence to add to what's already been pre-circulated, we're happy to proceed to questions. Questions, yep. Machine, you don't need it highlighted, or did you already cover it? No, I don't think so. Okay, question. Yeah, I just had a question, you might have heard it um, earlier, was just around understanding the, the movement of vehicles, particularly related to the operations. Mm -hmm. um, and so from your evidence, you've identified, you know, what, what, are the, what are the types of things that come to the plant and what are the types of things that leave the plant, but I was wanting to have an understanding of how that works in a practical sense, you know, sort of a day-to-day, week-to-week kind of a, a snapshot of, of the operation. Of the operation. Once, once it's completed. Sure, so, so yeah, if we think about the stage two completion, yeah. so that's with the, the two high speed bottling lines plus yes. the original yep. bottling line. Um, so yeah, materials uh, coming onto the site uh, are packaging primarily, um, and that's from two sources. So there's um, preforms which are imported from China, um, and then there's cardboard and, and paper packaging um, which comes locally. Um, and that will come onto site in a combination of curtain cider trucks and containers, depending on whether it's export yep. or local supply. Um, I guess at this stage it's, it's hard to say what the timing of that will exactly be and how that will come in terms of ships coming to site and how quickly that will come to the site. Um, so when we do our assessment, we have to work on a, an assumed sort of throughput through the plant and then make an assessment on the the numbers associated with that mm. averaged across across a typical month. Um, the in terms of the finished goods, uh, obviously the water's going through the the water bottling plant is bottled, um, and then put into the the cardboard boxes and onto pallets, uh, and then stored in racking at the facility. Um, it is then loaded into containers on the site and uh, we have provision on the site for storage of some of those containers to allow for any fluctuation in terms of container access and that sort of thing that does happen from time to time. Yeah, how, how many again is it you're, you're, th you're thinking in terms of containers? Uh, it's about 200 from memory, I'd have to check to be. What sure. size What size were those containers? Uh, mostly 20 foot. Oh, 20 so the, for the finished goods it's 20 foot. The incoming packaging is likely to come in on, on 40 foot containers. Right. Um, so those containers are then loaded onto trucks um, for, uh, to take to the port and for loading onto ships. And again, uh, I guess crews will still have to go through the process of finalising some of those logistical sort of issues around that, um, and that will sort of impact a bit around how that's managed overall. But there is sort of capacity on the site, I guess, to, to handle some of those fluctuations. Um, so that's, that's the main materials coming in and out, and that, that sort of is the bulk of the, the truck movements for the site. Uh, other ones will be, uh, there will be solid waste, so um, 
the nature of these plants is is there will from time to time be um, packaging malfunctions and those sort of things that happen which will result in waste, solid waste. Um, so that gets compacted on site uh, and would be removed from site by truck. Um, and then you've got um, the waste from the uh, processed waste and in particular the nitric acid which we've um, taken the approach to store the, and this is used in the cleaning process yep. for the plant on a monthly basis. Um, so we've taken the approach to store that nitric or the spent nitric acid uh, in a tank on site and then uh, have that trucked off site once a month. Um, the other movements onto site are likely to be uh, effectively fuel. So you have diesel for uh, mainly for the equipment on site for refueling uh, and also LPG for the boiler. Um, so supplying of those materials to the to the site. So in terms of the, the, the packaging that comes onto the site, what, what would you expect would be the normal time for that to go through the that product chain from arrive, that, that material arriving, being stored and being, being used and then going out, out on the truck? What's the, the yeah, time so period for that? So the imported materials, so yes, the, imported um, materials. the ones from China, uh, we've, we've allowed for four weeks storage okay. at the site. Yep. Um, and that, that's really around if, if you get you know, the, the logistics of getting um, packaging materials to the site are such that you, you need enough storage to cover sort of if, if a ship doesn't make it or, or there's some issue, then you can still maintain production. Um, for the local supply, we've allowed for two weeks storage on site. <clears throat> no further questions, Mr. Joyce. Thank you for your evidence. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> I dare say it'll be Mr. Mr. Joyce doing the uh, the calcs in the background um, about the other questions around numbers truck of trucks as well. Cool. Thank you. I think that's a matter for another day. Um, the next witness uh, will correct me, no doubt, but uh, Yondre Fanzil is here. Yondre, and do you have a do you have a supplementary statement to table? You do, don't you? Yes, I'll make sure the panel gets copies of that before you speak to it. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And do you have copies for the reporting officers? Yes, we do, sorry. Um, is this spare? Yes. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is um, Jan Andres Van Zoll, um, um, more known as Jan Ray. Um, I'm a civil engineer at associate level with Becker. Um, my previous experience includes civil engineering, design, construction, and I'm currently in a team leader role. I'm the lead civil engineer for this project. Um, my events relates to the construction, general civil, Earthworks, stormwater, stormwater during construction and pr the proposed concept design, the road and pavement design and protecting existing services. The chair of the panel asked some questions rela relating to my evidence and I have provided writ written an answers to those questions. Yep, thank you for that. Um, Mallory Osman has answered other questions regarding the proposed erosion and sediment control management, man management plan and other conditions. As, as concluded in my um, evidence in the summary, I consider that all the adverse effects related to my evidence are considered to be to an acceptable level or I cease to be less than minor. Um, I'll, I'll just direct the panel to, um, to the second page on the road pavement protecting existing services section, mm -hmm. the second paragraph. Um, this is just some recent information that's come to light. Um, and this is further to item um, 49 in my evidence. Um, during construction, during design and construction, um, Crestwell and its contractors will work with the asset owners to protect or relocate any affected services. However, I understand um, um, from key friends that the Whakatani District Council, Whakatani Council 
are planning to relocate the water main which was uh, concerned in one of the submissions. Um, this will be relocated to outside the footprint of the road except for at crossing points. And I'll just finish. Um, I have read the 4-2A reports prepared by the Whakatane District Council and the Bay of Plenty Regional Council and they also considered that all the effects related to construction and stormwater management will be appropriately mitigated and or avoided and I agree with this. I, I also consider that my evidence have answered all the submitters questions, concerns with respect to construction, general civil, earthworks, stormwater and the road upgrade works. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Anton, any questions? Um, perhaps a note, I, I've asked a question earlier around um, the likelihood of archaeology on site and obviously that ha may have an impact in terms of earthworks but we might wait till we get the response back from that and then perhaps come back to you if, you've take, if anything needs to be taken into account but that's, so that's a, that's a non-question for you. Thanks. Yeah. No, no, don't go. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to... Um, ask you a little bit more about the question I put to you in writing and that you answered in writing. Thank yep. you for that answer, you don't need to read that. But So my understanding of the stormwater management system, and you correct me if I'm wrong, okay, is that in events less than the 100 year 72 hour event, the discharge from the stormwater management system to Hallett Drain would be the same as the existing pre-development discharges, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And then you say that in those situations, the flow rate or the discharge rate would be 31 litres per second, which is the maximum discharge rate in that 100-year storm. Yep. So will all of the discharges below that 100-year event be at a rate of 31 litres per second, or would that vary depending on the size of the storm? It will depend on the size of the storm. Okay, right. But the key point is that there will be no more than the pre-development discharges. Correct. Okay. In terms of in the 100 year storm or greater events, the maximum discharge of 31 litres per second, how is that achieved? What's the mechanism by which the f discharge is throttled down to just being no more than 31 litres per second? Can you briefly describe the mechanism for that? Yeah. So we haven't looked in detail of the outlet structure, mm -hmm. how that's going to look like, but in typical examples, is either an orifice or a structure which right. will restrict the flood. Pretty standard techniques. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's pretty standard. Okay, thank you very much for that. No further questions. Thank you. <coughs> thank you, sir. The, the next witness is um, <coughs> the landscape architect Sue McManaway. Yes, you do. Do you I have do, but they're not uh, materially wondering if they're even substantial. Yep. Is, it, is it wrong? No, no, no. no. So there is a supplementary statement that um, Ms McManaway has. I'm going to get and have some copies. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, kia ora. Uh, my full name is Susan Jane McManaway and I'm a senior landscape architect at Pukera Limited. In light of the Commissioner's um, precept related question to Mr French regarding traffic volumes, um, and in the context of concerns about effects on rural character and amenity and cumulative effects, I just wanted to add um, a few extra observations. Yep. Okay, uh, the plant is located within the rural plain zone on the site of an existing water bottle bottling operation in Kiwi Fruit Orchard, ringed by a tall shelter belt, and that's maintained to a height of approximately 10 metres. The wider plains landscape is predominantly rural, and it represents a history of landscape change from wetlands to predominantly intensive agriculture and horticulture. Nearby, the rural foothills include extractive activities such as quarrying and forestry. The site and landscape immediately surrounding it share typical working rural characteristics. Those include open farmed paddocks and enclosed orchards, as well as the existing water bottling activity. 
There are also a number of lifestyle properties in the area, and these have a more domesticated than productive character. The site does not form part of an outstanding natural feature or landscape or significant amenity landscape. An assessment of effects on rural character and amenity involves weighing up the values or attributes of the existing rural landscape and its sensitivity to change, or conversely, its capacity to accommodate that change, and the magnitude of the proposed change in order to arrive at an overall significance of effects. I consider the site itself and most surrounding properties have a good capacity to accommodate the large scale of change due in part to the existing water bottling plant and presence of this activity elsewhere in the wider landscape and to the retention and management of the shelter belts as well as the additional mitigation which will internalise most adverse rural character and amenity effects within the property boundaries. However, the project will also generate a substantial increase in truck movements between the site and State Highway 34. Effects occur at different scales. I consider that at the wider scale, rural character and amenity will be maintained. At a site-specific scale, there are a small number of residences along Johnson Road and Hallett Road that are within 100 metres of the road and overlook it. There is potential for their level of rural amenity to be diminished. I do not consider it will be significant. Key potential effects of the trucks on the rural amenity of these residences are related to any change in views that they generate and to the existing level of quietness. Intervening garden or roadside vegetation mean the full length of the road is not visible, but sections of it. And as the trucks move past, their level of prominence rapidly reduces. The trucks will represent a noticeable increase in intensity of activity, but will not cause permanent physical change to the view or landscape. In terms of noise, I note Mr Higley's evidence that while individual trucks will be heard, the effects of traffic noise will be well within guidelines, and the level of change in amenity is reasonable. I also note the vehicle movements calculated are based on the peak heavy traffic volume, and the average would be less than this. I certainly respect and acknowledge that for some individuals going about their daily activities, the cumulative effects of the level of truck movements, along with other effects of the scale and operation of the plant, may be a considerable change. Nonetheless, in weighing up existing rural character and amenity, the magnitude of change and the potential for cumulative effects, I note that rural landscapes are inhabited landscapes not to be confused with wilderness or natural landscapes. The location of this project is a productive rural environment and objectives and policies in the Whakatane District Plan relating to rural character and amenity acknowledge the working nature of the rural environment as well as the need to accommodate people and open space and natural features. On balance, I consider that landscape and visual effects, including cumulative effects on rural amenity, will largely be contained and in terms of the area impacted by vehicle movements are not widespread. They will be adequately mitigated by limits on hours of operation and vehicle speed as well as landscape planting and colour treatment. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Anton, quickly. Um, I didn't know. No, no, I have no further questions. Thank you very much. The next, next witness, sir, is um, Neville Higley, a noise um, an acoustics expert. Yep. There's no supplementary written statement to provide you with. Morning. Morning, sir. Uh, if you have no supplementary material, are you happy for us to proceed to question? Absolutely. Anton. Spinal, no. No. Mr Higley, I've just got one question for you. In the application documents, um, all the information provided soon after it was the applicant volunteered a speed limit for the trucks of 40 kilometres an hour uh, in terms of amenity and, and other effects. I understand based on your evidence to Mr Frentz that figure is now 60 kilometres an hour. Could you explain to us how that figure was derived, please? The prediction of traffic noise is normally based on a 24 hour NEQ value mm -hmm. uh, and significantly higher traffic flows than we would ever experience at this site. 
So it's made the analysis a bit more difficult, shall we say. Mm -hmm. I have taken an individual vehicle, heavy truck, passing based on a measured measurement. Mm -hmm. Now, the noise from that truck is dependent on a combination of level and the time of exposure. So, to put it simply, if you have a very high level for a short time, you have the same exposure as a lower level for a long time. If you slow a truck down, it's present for longer. So, mm. you have great exposure. So, what happens is between about 40 and 60 K, the actual noise exposure you get, or the noise dose, is similar. If you go very slow, right. it obviously is quiet, although not significant, because technically when you're driving a truck, the engine speed remains constant, and you change the gear accordingly. At a speed below 40k, it's engine noise that controls. Mm -hmm. So if you work on the theoretical driving of a truck, once you're below 40, it makes no difference. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you don't drive theoretically, you drive as a person. Yeah. So it's not quite like that. If you get above about 60k, road noise starts to become a controlling factor. So there the level does increase. These increases are relatively small. That's dealing with a single vehicle. Mm -hmm. I've modelled in two techniques, one taking a commercially available computer prediction model and used a standard truck and analyse it like that. And then I've taken the second technique, as I've said, I've measured truck noise in the field and used that as a source to put in the computer model. I've got a similar result in both cases. Okay. Perception is another thing. If a truck drives past, or a vehicle drives past with a truck or anything, people think it's going to be noisier, so that's a perceived difference. So that's also taken into account, but I think once you're below, you know, in the 40 to 60k, it doesn't make a big difference there. Road maintenance, I've assumed the road is in good condition, in other words, there's not a lot of potholes or anything like that, and currently the road's reasonable maintenance. That's something beyond the applicant's control, and that's a council thing, but I think it's fair to say that if it's a pothole, it would be fixed pretty quickly. And that creates noise by simply a truck would hit it and got body rattle. Yeah. But that's very specific to a particular location, the road should be there at the time. So that's really how it boils down. And I thank you very much for that. So just um, I put back to you what the key points I've taken. So uh, the level of exposure or the effects that people um, will perceive is based on two things. It's the actual noise coming from the truck or, or the road noise plus the duration of exposure to that. And between 40 and 60 k's, there's no real differentiation. Therefore, the point that Mr French raised in his answers to my questions being that his, the feedback from local residents was that they didn't want to be slowed down by slow trucks on the road. From your point of view, there's no noise issue with moving to 60 k's as opposed to 40 k's. No, and, and from a perception point of view with other projects I've been involved with where there's a noise people would rather get over and done with. Yeah, okay. All right, thank you for that. Commissioner Coffins. I just have a question, question of clarification. It was just around the, the acoustic fence, which I understand is going to be on the southern side and also on the western side. Is that at the site boundary? Just with the maps that we have, though, it's quite the, it's quite small, and you can't quite see which line is the where the, the fence will be, or is it um, closer to the plant? Depends on the fence we're talking about. It's also the uh, fluid where we put it. Um, I've modelled it. I've got a pretty one for us. Yeah, runs yeah, runs around the site boundary at the bottom. So you know. That's where I've modelled it. Yep. I've yeah. not taken into account any of the effects, screening effects containers would have. No. Because while they're on site, they obviously do yep. it, but I can't guarantee they'll always be there. The idea yep. is to get them off site. Mm -hmm. Yeah, understood. I think it was, was it 2.4 metres was the height? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, anything else? Oh, oh. 
No, no further questions, but uh, thank you, Mr. Hegley. As usual, your evidence is uh, comprehensive and helpful. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Craig Richards is the next witness. Uh, 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 traffic engineer. Good morning. Good morning. All right, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Sorry. And again, sir, no supplementary evidence to the table. Okay. So are you happy for us to proceed to questions? Yes, of course. Questions for the traffic. Professor. Yeah, I had just a, a, a question around the truck movements, the 184, and, and, and um, obviously we had the legal submission this morning in, in terms of that, that's a peak and that's what I had understood. It. That's, that's a, a worst case scenario, but obviously with the bottling plant during the day, during the night, certain times of the year, depending on the markets and all those types of things, there'd be highs and lows, and it was just trying to understand that a little bit better in terms of perhaps a day-to-day, week-to-week, what that actually looks like on the road. Yeah, I, I, look, um, I'm not sure what the variation will be. I mm -hmm. think um, Mr Joyce would probably get back to you on that, but in terms of my assessment, the 184 is, like, is the peak, um, which we've assessed that has been the peak enough volume of trucks. Um, that would be, I understand, during the peak season. Um, obviously, if there's fewer trucks than that, then um, the, the mitigation proposed obviously also um, supports the, a lower volume of, of trucks, um, but we've assessed that the peak is 184. Okay. And I have no further questions. Thank you for your evidence, uh, which was largely based on your traffic assessment report. So yep. thank you very much for that. Um, <clears throat> making good progress. Sue so Aitken is the next witness um, who's provided a, a geotechnical assessment of the integrity of the, the stop back. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a, no, good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, my full name is Susan Aitken. I'm a principal geotechnical engineer with Becker in Tauranga. Mm -hmm. um, and my evidence was relating to the effects of the project on the geotechnical security of the Tarawera River stop bank, um, which is adjacent to the western boundary. Yep. There's no evidence um, to the update that I've, oh, sorry, there's no update to the evidence that I've already provided. And I concluded that the existing stability of that inland slope is um, very high and that uh, any future excavations proposed um, with the project within 60 metres uh, will not impact that level of security. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I don't have any questions for this. Um, no questions from me, but um, did read with interest and found very helpful the geotechnical stock bank assessment report that you prepared and that was pre-circulated. So thank you. Thank you very much for that. There were, there were no questions from Commissioner Coffin. Oh, I missed that. No, he said no <laughs> questions. <laughs> so he legged it. His, ge um. <coughs> his geotechnical concerns have been satisfied by pre-circulated <laughs> report. Excellent, thank you. Uh, and Emma Lewis. This is Emma Lewis. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Emma Lewis. I'm a contaminated land specialist at Becker. Uh, my evidence related to the assessment of contamination effects and proposed mitigation, if any. Um, I understand that my evidence has been read uh, mm -hmm. by the panel. I therefore wasn't proposing to run through anything unless you would like me to. No, no. Um, no supplementary material to table? No supplementary okay. material. Happy All right. to take anything. Questions? Contaminated land? I, yeah, I did have a... This was a question perhaps for my own benefit and understanding. There was a... Go to it specifically. And sorry, Mr. Randall, this wasn't the question that I'd uh, mentioned to you earlier. Feel free um, to answer any questions, sir, that come to you. I'll put this in the box of dumb questions. Um, it's, it's the presence of contaminants in the soils that exist that are on the for, um, on, the, on the orchard, and they were identified as arsenic, cadmium, and copper and zinc. And I, I'm assuming those are related specifically to orchard activities, particularly with the kiwi fruit production. So it was just a confirmation that that is the case. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Uh, and Perhaps, um, obviously, there will be earthworks will be undertaken, and there was, I think, one occurrence of high levels concentrations of, I'm not sure, can't remember which it was contaminant arsenic was, was arsenic, yeah. and whether there was anything in place 
if the during earthworks those soils were uncovered and what might be the sure. the appropriate um, management of that. We we have a an existing contaminated soils management plan, which okay. um, essentially is to um, manage um, any potential discharge of soils. Um, that arsenic result was considered to be an outlier result and wasn't representative of the contamination status of the white okay. site, which was indeed very low. So the site isn't considered to be contaminated. Thank you. I didn't have any further questions. No. <coughs> the um, information provided by the reporting officers was that Emma Joss um, from the Regional Council reviewed your work and she was happy with it. Did you have any direct liaison or communication with Ms Joss? We, um, we always consult uh, with regional and local authority and so yes, we did consult with um, okay. Ms Joss. Okay. Thank you very much for your evidence and for the pre-circulated material. No further questions. Thank you. Mike Goff is the next witness, sir, and I understand he he does have supplementary evidence okay. at the table. Uh, it may take a little, a little bit longer. There's, there's no rush. Just Sorry. because we have no questions, you don't need to rush through. Witnesses no. who do have supplementary material. Okay, that's good. <coughs> good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mike Goff. I'm the hydrogeologist with Becca and Karanga. I'll be uh, presenting some supplementary statements of evidence. Uh, it will take about 20 minutes to get through, if everybody's okay with that. Yeah, that's fine. All right. My supplementary statement addresses matters raised in the submitter's evidence filed since my written evidence was provided on 13th of April 2018 in respect to the potential effect of Creswell's proposed groundwater take. In light of that evidence, I discussed briefly the technical work done by GNS and the Bay of Plenty Regional Council to allocate groundwater resources in the Wadey Canal catchment. The results of the testing at site and my assessment of the project's effects on other groundwater users and the environment, including issues of effect on the water table aquifer and the surface water, saline intrusion, and land subsidence. Regarding allocation of groundwater resources, a number of submitters have filed evidence regarding sustainability of the groundwater take. Before commenting on that evidence, I first wish to make a minor correction to my written evidence of 13th April. In paragraph 36 of that evidence, I state that the allocable flow has been recalculated to be 232.96 liters per second. In actuality, the allocated flow after surrender of the existing Robertson consent and including the proposed groundwater take is 232.96 liters per second. In terms of submitters' concerns about the proposed take, I have reviewed the GNS report that forms the basis of the allocation of groundwater in the Rangitaki Plains and the Oedi Canal catchment. The report takes a water budget approach based on a geologic model of features of the study area. Assumptions taken are indicated and conservative concessions to leaving water in the aquifer are noted appropriately. One output of this report is the groundwater available for allocation, or GAA, for the Awadi Canal catchment of 764 liters per second. I consider that this GAA is conservative and that it underestimates the amount of groundwater available for allocation. My view is based on a number of factors. For example, estimates of specific discharge, namely surface water base flow, are higher than observed during low flow periods in drought conditions. The effect of overestimation of specific discharge is an overestimation of the amount of water going to the surface water. Also, groundwater inflows are not included within the budget. 3,464 liters per second in the case of a weedy canal groundwater catchment. So recharge is based only on rainfall for the catchment area and consideration on a catchment scale ignores the confined aquifer, the Otakiri aquifer, that has no discharge to surface water but receives significant groundwater inflow. 
I've also reviewed the Bay of Plenty Regional Council report that establishes allocations available for the catchments of the Rangitaki Plains, and in particular, the Awadi Canal catchment, entitled Assessment of Water Availability and Estimates of Current Allocation Levels, October 2016. The annual average recharge, AAR, of the, BO, of the Bay of Plenty report is equivalent to the groundwater available for allocation, the GAA and the GNS report. Of the AAR, 65% is retained in the aquifer and 35% is available for allocation. In my experience, this is a very conservative method of allocating groundwater resources and in this case is combined with a very conservative estimate of the quantity of those resources. In many parts of the world, sustainable groundwater allocation is anything less than annual recharge minus discharge the existing takes, surface water, and groundwater output. Results of the testing and assessment of effects in regards to effect on other groundwater users. Evidence on assessment uncertainties were received from Jaime <coughs> Canal on behalf of Nadi Tuperateo, Tuperatoa? Tuperatoa. Tuperatoa, thank you. Uh, Mr. Canal expressed concern over unintended consequences to the aquifer not yet identified and the insufficiency of the reservoir assessment process and aquifer modeling carried out to ensure effects of this groundwater take are no more than minor. The hydrogeologic investigation and assessment of effects have been concluded in a manner reflecting standard technical practice with consideration of limiting uncertainties where possible. The constant rate flow testing conducted to determine aquifer hydraulic coefficients was made at significantly higher rates than is intended under the proposed take. The discharge rate during the constant rate test was 80 liters per second or 27% higher than the requested maximum instantaneous take of 58, or more than double the average take of 34.9 liters per second. The increased rate of testing provided increased stress to the aquifer that will not occur during normal operations. Flow testing at this increased rate resulted in discharge water levels stabilizing within two hours into the constant rate test and not var varying by more than 0.1 meters through to the end of the seven day constant rate test. Upon cessation of the constant rate test, the well recovered quickly with over 90% of water level recovery occurring within the first two minutes. These water level responses indicate that the production well was constructed into a very productive aquifer and the dis discharge resulted in minimal stress to the aquifer. Modeling of effects of long-term take were made using two methods. The analytical method based on TICE is accepted as being a conservative approach as it does not consider vertical recharge for aquifers above or below the producing aquifer. The 3D groundwater flow model was constructed to match conditions per the available information. In an effort to limit the uncertainty and assess sensitivity, the aquifer hydraulic coefficients used in modeling of effects were reduced from those estimated from the testing. As per the table in my evidence, in summary, transmissivity, which is the ease with which water moves through the aquifer, was reduced in the base modeling, which is what we believe to be a conservative estimate, by 15%. And by the most conservative method, we have reduced that ease of water going through the aquifer by 88%. Similarly, storativity was reduced. Storativity is the amount of water that can be held within the aquifer material. That was reduced by 44% in our, in our base case of conservative simulation. And in the most, uh, most restrictive, we have reduced it by 97%. I can talk in more detail about how to visualize that if you have questions. Okay, moving on to 17. To further reduce effects of uncertainty and assess sensitivity, the modeled effects were taken at the long-term maximum instantaneous take of 58 liters per second, as well as the average instantaneous take of 34.9 liters per second. 
results of the sensitivity runs using hydraulic aquifer hydraulic coefficients from tests at greater than the proposed take indicate that effects on other users in the environment will be negligible. Mr. Canal indicates that groundwater monitoring should be included to determine the overall health of the aquifer. Groundwater monitoring is not recommended as being necessary as part of the proposed take. As findings of the assessment indicate, negligible effects on the other groundwater users, the shallow and confined <coughs> aquifer, the Tarawera River, subsidence and saline intrusion. Evidence from Turanonga Madiawa regarding the leaky nature of the Yotakiri aquifer and potential for contamination from the paper mill and geothermal areas upgrading. Number 20. The term leaky aquifer indicates that the confining units above and or below a confined aquifer have some vertical leakance. The term leakance is the vertical hydraulic conductivity divided by the thickness of the confining unit. Leakance estimated from the flow testing is 0 .0005. This means that a 100 meter thick confining unit would have a vertical hydraulic conductivity of about 0 .05 meters per day. Given the low drawdown in the aquifer adjacent to the confining layer, and the lack of any response in the water table during testing, the effect of leakance is negligible with respect to effect on the water table, surface water, and wetland areas. The aquifer is under significant hydraulic pressure, meaning that contaminants in the water table cannot migrate into the pressurized <coughs> aquifer. Water quality has been monitored since water bottling commenced at the site. Analyses indicate that the water quality has been stable and is not influenced by geothermal sources. This is confirmed in the analysis of water from the recently completed production well, PW2. Number 22, effect on the water table aquifer, surface water and wetlands. Evidence has also been received expressing concerns about effects on the water table aquifer, surface water and wetlands on behalf of Turananga Natiawa. My assessment is that the testing on site and the assessment of effects indicate the drawdown induced as a result of the proposed take will have negligible effects on the water table and surface water. During the constant rate test, water levels in the water table aquifer showed no drawdown effect as a result of the discharge from the Odakiri <laughs> aquifer. The Odakiri aquifer is hydraulically confined from the water table and surface water features. The Bay of Plenty Regional Council technical reviewer agrees with these views. Tukoika Swamp Pa is located approximately 11 kilometers down gradient of the project site. The proposed groundwater take from the Otakiri Aquifer is not assessed to have any effect on the water table or the Tarawara River at the project site, nor is the proposed take expected to affect wetlands down gradient. The Otakiri Aquifer is confined from the surficial hydrology. The groundwater allocation of the Wadi Canal catchment is being sustainably managed and is conservative in benefit to the groundwater and surface water environments. Assessment of effects of saline intrusion. Information on saline intrusion was submitted by Christopher Sides. As agreed by the Bay of Plenty Regional Council Technical Review, saline intrusion is not likely to occur. The assessment, this assessment is based on distance from the coast of the project and a significant hydraulic head in the aquifer. The guyvin herzberg equation noted in the submission on this topic is used as a conservative estimate of the saltwater interface <coughs> based on thickness of fresh water in the aquifer above sea level and disregards distance from the shoreline. When correctly applied to conditions at the site, the guyvin herzberg equation indicates that the saline interface is at least 1,000 meters below the land surface. Assessment of effects uh, land subsidence. Information on land subsidence was received by Christopher Sides and Jaime Canal on behalf of Nadi Toroteo mm -hmm. Settlement Trust. As agreed by the Bay of Plenty Regional Council Technical Review, land subsidence is not likely to occur as a result of the proposed groundwater take. This assessment is based on the incompressibility of the producing aquifer. 
the significant positive hydraulic hit on the aqua, and the lack of drawdown effect on the water table. One submitter refers to subsidence of the Pawcatani Graben and effects of the 1987 Edgecombe earthquake as evidence of the connection to groundwater take. The Pawcatani Graben is a structural feature related to the top paw rift zone and associated faults of the North Island fault zone. The Edgecombe Fault carries the major displacement of the Fukatani Graben with 2,300 meters of vertical throw. The Edgecombe Fault was the locus of the principal rupture plane for the 1987 Edgecombe earthquake. Depth of the epicenter was 8 kilometers and was unlikely related to groundwater extraction but is related to the continued tectonic activity in the Fukatani Graben. Subsidence as a result of groundwater extraction is not likely to occur. Subsidence as a result of groundwater extraction generally occurs in compressible materials that are dewatered or depressurized as a result of groundwater extraction. The PW2 well constructed at the site is constructed into welded Matahina ignimbrate, which is essentially incompressible. The aquifer is confined from the surficial aquifer, so drawdown is not likely to occur on the water table. Maximum projected effect on the production well, which is the point of greatest drawdown as a result of the proposed take, will still result in a pumping water level of about 14 meters above land surface, given the significant artesian head of the aquifer. By comparison, the deep reservoir, equivalent to an aquifer, Depressurization at the Kaurau geothermal field since 2008 has been measured at 2 to 5.3 bars, or over 50 meters. Depressurization of the reservoir, reservoir in Kaurau has been linked to the approximate 10, 10 millimeter per year subsidence rate measured at the surface around the Kaurau geothermal fields. The 50 meter, this 50 meter depressurization has occurred over the area of the geothermal field over a 10 year period. The effect of the proposed groundwater take estimated over the duration of the requested consent is about five meters, and that is within the production well bore. Need for monitoring. A comment on need for monitoring conditions was received by Mr. Kanaw. Mr. Kanaw suggests that reservoir aquifer monitoring conditions are required. Given that the proposed groundwater take is within the available allocation of the catchment and that conservative assessments have indicated that effects on other users and the environment will be negligible, I do not see that a condition of this groundwater take should include monitoring of aquifer conditions. In conclusion, based on the work I've done and review of other work done in the area and on the Otakiri Aquifer, I consider that the proposed groundwater take is sustainable. I'll be happy to answer any questions, and I've got some ideas on uh, the Fukatani District Council conditions and the uh, swamp pond. I know those were brought up previously. Yes. I, you've, you've actually responded to my question, so uh, thank you very much. And well, okay. Thank you very much. Very good. And I also yeah. have no further questions now that you've read the supplementary material out to us. Okay. But th you wanted to add something you said in relation to district council conditions? Is that what you said? The, um, well, only that I, I, I know the condition is there and uh, perhaps it should be formalized. In reality, I don't know that it'll ever need to be enacted. The existing bore 932 on Jim Robertson's site was installed in 1985 and has never needed chemical flushing or rehabilitation in 33 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and the drilling that we did, I don't believe that actually affected turbidity in the production wells. But those are details that we don't need to get into here. I'm sure it can be handled. Joe Cranswick suggested an agreement between the, mm. the client and council, and I think that might be the way to go. Okay. Mm. Right, thank you very much. I have no further questions, but just I um, found the report on the um, testing of well PW2 to be very informative and helpful and answered a lot of the questions that I'd had when reading the application documentation.
It's a fascinating aquifer, and uh, it's the probably the most productive aquifer I've ever seen. Yeah, good. Thank you Thank very you. much. All right, we'll now adjourn for lunch. Adjourn now and reconvene at 1.15. Thank you.